Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I am the director of speakingofwomenshealth.com. And I am back in the Sunflower House for a brand new episode. And what we're going to talk about today is back pain, sciatica. Oh, I'm dedicating this podcast to several people. All my patients who've ever suffered with low back pain, which is a high percent of the population. My brother, uh, who just had a big birthday, uh, who asked me to do a podcast on back pain and sciatica. And I have a good friend who is really suffering with uh, this right now. So it's very timely. It's very common. It's certainly not my area of expertise, but we all have a spine and it really wasn't all that well designed to be upright on just two legs. So our lower back takes quite the beating. And since I'm in the anti-aging field and I dedicate my career to empowering women to be strong, be healthy, and be in charge and really take charge of the second half of their life, this is uh, a very important topic for all. And my husband, Tom, who I've talked about in some of my podcasts, he has had uh, back pain, sciatica, and had some congenital spinal stenosis and needed a uh, low back, minimally invasive procedure. So over time, through going to medical school and residency, as well as seeing thousands and thousands of patients, I've certainly watched people's course and helped advise them. So as I mentioned, over three-fourths of adults in the United States have back pain. And so if you have back pain, it's very important to see your physician for an evaluation. Now, some of this content I'm taking from our speakingofwomenshealth.com website, and uh, we have a lot of information as well on the clevelandclinic.org site. So Candice Price, who is in the Center for Integrative Medicine, and lifestyle medicine, she wrote a great guest column on how to help with lower back pain. And it can be disabling, it can be tricky to deal with, and she noted that 84% of adults undergo some sort of evaluation for low back pain at some point in their lives. The good news is most of the time back pain resolves uh, without any invasive treatments. But there are some serious conditions, such as cauda equina syndrome, metastatic cancer that goes to the bone, and rarely spinal infections, an example tuberculosis, can involve the spine. But in general, nonspecific musculoskeletal uh, dysfunction is the cause of low back pain. Now, I really like to separate low back pain from pain that originates in the back that presses on the nerves that causes leg pain. That in general is much more amenable to surgical intervention. And so a lot of my patients and family members who may need a surgical procedure on their spine are very hesitant to do that because they know the bad reputation that a lot of spine surgery has had. And in general, spine surgery for just back pain, not leg pain, uh, that's extremely well correlated with the dermatones of the nerves that exit the spine and how it enervates the lower extremities. So we're first going to just talk about general self-care for your back because we all should be good to our back. If you have some low back pain, You want to stay moving. And it's certainly recommended that those that suffer from low back pain try to return to their usual activities of daily living as soon as possible because bed rest actually generally leads to a slower recovery and more pain. 
But if you do require bed rest due to severe symptoms, um, you do want to be evaluated and you do want to make plans to return to activities of daily living. So modifying one's activity due to pain should be reduced as much as possible. The goal is to try to do as many of your life activities with as few adaptations as possible. Now, initially, heat and stretching can be very helpful and can reduce muscle spasms. When using a heating pad, uh, use the low setting, don't burn yourself, and generally do about 20 minutes every two hours. After you warm up and heat the muscles, you can then stretch the muscles depending on the point of pain that you have. But if stretching makes the pain worse, then you have to obviously stop it. You might be pressing on a nerve root. In terms of over-the-counter medicines, certainly non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like aspirin and Motrin, um, ibuprofen is the generic name, may help. Plain Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, may help, <clears throat> but you want to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time. And sometimes these medicines are not effective, and the NSAIDs can affect your blood pressure, your stomach, kidney function, uh, and isn't really getting at the root of the problem. Now, spinal manipulative therapy uh, is a manual therapy that focuses on restoring joint movement, and joint function. It's usually part of chiropractic care, and we do have chiropractors on staff at the Cleveland Clinic, but spinal manipulation may be performed by other health professionals, such as physical therapists and doctors of osteopathy, DOs, like I'm an MD, an allopathic medical doctor. But there's another track to become a physician, which is a DO, which is a doctor of osteopathy. And they do focus a lot on the spine. For acute back pain, there's moderate evidence to support reduction in pain symptoms and improved function. For subacute and chronic back pain, uh, spinal manipulation appears to give some small short-term benefit of reduced pain and improved function compared to other intervention strategies. Spinal manipulation helps you to follow. What we want to emphasize is to stay moving. Acupuncture. I've personally done acupuncture for tennis elbow because when I went from playing tennis once a week to twice a week, since my tendons aren't the best, I had, um, so much pain, I couldn't even pick up a, a cup of black coffee in the morning. And I didn't really want to go with steroid injections. And there are certain conditions, which tennis elbow is one of them, and uh, low back pain, that there's some evidence of improvement. And there is some support for the use of acupuncture in chronic low back pain. When it's effective, it's typically seen in the first seven days of treatment. Acupuncture has few side effects and is generally considered safe for most people. And if it's available by a well-trained person and you want to avoid invasive treatments, it's something to pursue and talk to your physician about. As I've mentioned many times before, our podcast is not medical advice. No, it's just health information to empower you to be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. <clears throat> Exercise and physical therapy. I've undergone physical therapy for a few conditions off and on in my life, and I have found it very helpful. And I would say that uh, having an objective external person assess your muscle strength, your gait, um, and look at you in ways, even if you already understand a lot about muscle physiology and tendons and anatomy and physiology, can be very helpful. I remember having a physician refer me to physical therapy, and he's like, well, you're a physician, you're probably not going to go because you think you already know this stuff. And I was really taken aback. I guess there are people that are like that. And I'm like, no, of course I want the expertise. And exercise directed and supervised by a physical therapist 
during the acute phase may certainly help avoid recurrences or the dreaded complication of chronic low back pain. So exercise programs generally are beneficial in both subacute, you know, acute means, uh, you just bend over, maybe brushing your teeth. I remember this would happen to our nurse practitioner who, um, uh, has since retired and she'd have a flare of, of, of back pain. Subacute is when it's going on for a few weeks, but it's not chronic and chronic means it's a long-term problem. And physical therapy is beneficial for both education on how to avoid recurrences, how to take care of the back, what is suitable physical activity, what exercises should be started after uh, the initial pain, and what should be the rehabilitation program. Now, physical therapists may also be referred to by other healthcare clinicians like chiropractors, osteopaths, or also occupational therapists. Though there may be countless other strategies to help manage low back pain, the man- management strategies that we're discussing are focused on it, improving function and reducing pain. Because everybody wants an active lifestyle and to maintain the function of their life. But if you have neurologic symptoms, pain, numbness, weakness, tingling, loss of bowel or bladder control, uh, fever, chills, acute abdominal pain, these things are not just regular low back pain that most of us experience, okay? That requires emergency evaluation. Now, for those of you listening in the Northeast Ohio uh, area, if you want to see any of our experts at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Integrative Lifestyle Medicine, you can call 216-448-4325 and hit option one. And we'll put that information in the show notes. And for rehabilitation exercises, one can schedule an appointment with a rehabilitation specialist at the Cleveland Clinic Department of Physical Med and Rehabilitation by calling 216-636-5860. And again, those will be in our show notes. You have been listening to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast with your host, Dr. Holly Thacker in the Sunflower House, and we are talking about low back pain, chronic pain, pain management, and we'll be getting to sciatica soon. This next column is by Dr. Robert Saper. He's an MD, PhD at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine, and he guest columned an article on how yoga can help with pain management. I'm personally not all that flexible. I have pretty tight tendons and I don't have a very flexible range of motion. I was never able to do the splits as a, as a child. And my younger son, Grayson, complains, I got my bad back from dad and I got my tight hips and tendons from you, mom. Um, and he actually had a terrible flare of um, probably a, a temporarily uh, slipped disc when he was in high school doing intensive weightlifting for football and basketball season, his senior year, he was kind of in between the two seasons and he had terrible acute pain and he got chiropractic manipulation, a short course of steroids. I remember one night he had so much pain. He had to sleep sitting up in our bedroom because he was in so much pain and it resolved. Um, And young people that are very athletic Uh, who put intense pressure on the lower back, even though they're young and they don't have all the degenerative disc disease and degenerative joint disease that most people over age 35 get, um, there can be acute neurologic symptoms. Luckily for him, the, the chiropractic manipulation and the physical therapy and attention to core muscle strength really helped stabilize his spine. So, In terms of yoga, I think people like myself and my uh, son, Grayson, who aren't the most flexible people, and and some of that obviously is genetic, 
related to your tendons and ligaments and muscle fibers. Uh, there are modified types of yoga that I think everyone can do and chair yoga. In fact, I'm going to try some modified uh, chair yoga when I'm done doing this podcast today. <clears throat> so getting back to Dr. Saper's column on yoga and how that helps with pain, he talks about a study that was conducted in Boston by himself and his colleagues. And he actually found that yoga is similarly effective as physical therapy to reduce pain, to improve function, and to reduce chronic lower back pain medicine use. And guidelines for treatment of chronic low back pain by the American College of Physicians issued in 2017 list yoga as recommended first-line treatment for chronic low back pain, along with other uh, non-pharmacologic approaches such as acupuncture, spinal manipulation, massage, oh, who can't go for a good massage, and mindfulness-based stress reduction, <clears throat> along with cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise, and Tai Chi. So you need to work with your healthcare team to work on a program that integrates safe and effective evidence-based treatments, non-pharmacologic, as well as medications if needed, as well as interventional procedures and surgery when appropriate. As I was mentioning my husband, um, after having our third child, Grayson, with the older boys, were running around, so he was constantly picking up Grayson as a baby, as a toddler, uh, and even as a young preschooler, just to keep up and keep the flow going, put a lot of pressure on his back. And he developed two episodes of actually paralysis where he couldn't walk. Um, and it was right before our older son's wedding, Stetson, the father of Artemis and Beatrice, who I talk about all the time. And it was very scary, of course. And he had an MRI of his spine because of neurologic symptoms. Uh, we generally don't do imaging symptoms if it's just chronic pain and you don't have fever or chills or neurologic symptoms. And the plain x-rays can show a lot of arthritis that don't necessarily correlate. But when you have something like paralysis, like my husband, um, or you're unable to move your leg or you have numbness or tingling or nerve root symptoms and signs on exam, then an MRI is needed. And his spinal cord, you could see it normal, and then it almost totally closed off at the site of the congenital stenosis and then reconstituted. I don't know how he lived with this for so many years. <clears throat> and I think he just kind of powered through it. And some people have higher uh, pain thresholds than others. I don't think it's good to ignore pain. I don't think it's good to let it um, absorb your life. But it was actually because of speaking of women's health and me always being on social media to post things on, on our Facebook and our Twitter, or formerly Twitter, now X, Pinterest, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You know, we have all the social media channels. So if you're on any of those, please, please look for us on speaking of women's health, uh, dot com is, is the name um, for the podcast on your podcast app. It's the name of our channel on YouTube, on Rumble. If you want to watch the podcast, you can go on Rumble. <clears throat> so because of that, I was looking at a lot of Cleveland Clinic um, social media, and I was reading about this minimally invasive uh, spinal uh, decompression mild procedure that's done on a lot of older people who have DJD and spinal canal stenosis. Uh, is also done on younger people with a congenital problem like my husband, where an anesthesiologist goes in through a minimally invasive incision and scoops out the extra ligamentum flavum. So before they do this, a lot of insurances require um, epidural spinal injections to see if uh, numbing the tissue and giving steroids, which will reduce inflammation, will reduce the pain. Because again, a lot of people have back pain, leg pain, and it may or may not correlate to what you see on the imaging. <clears throat> he had immediate removal. He said he felt like a new person. Um, it was so dramatic, but then it weaned and wore, wore off. And so he had to get another couple injections before insurance 
would cover the procedure, which Medicare interestingly covered long before commercial insurance because it's so much less expensive than an open neurosurgical procedure on the lower back, which, you know, he was just not interested in based on, you know, hearing so many bad stories um, with back pain. But I told him I had many patients in their 80s undergo this procedure. And uh, Dr. Nagy McHale, who's an excellent um, anesthesiologist and pain doctor who I trained with years ago, who's in charge of our pain anesthesia, um, minimally invasive uh, program, did a fabulous job. And so I didn't have to worry about my husband having another paralytic episode. So again, those dramatic cases with neurologic involvement um, are not just along the course of the non-invasive treatments. It doesn't mean you still may not want, of course, to do physical therapy to strengthen your back or yoga or periodic massages. Or um, I'm a big fan of the inversion table. My husband and I have matching inversion tables. So every morning I always start out by stretching my spine and reducing the pressure, both the neck and the lower back. <clears throat> and really anything that you do, you want to make sure that it's medically appropriate with your health, health team. But if you want more information about yoga or other non-invasive, non-pharmacologic therapies for pain, you can contact the Department of Wellness and Preventive Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, and their website is clevelandclinic.org forward slash integrative medicine. And their number is 216-448-4325. Again, we'll put all that in the show notes. So how about posture for a healthy back? Prolonged sitting is not a good thing. I'm sitting right now doing this podcast. If I stand up, though, I'll be outside of the range of the camera. But a lot of people get standing work desk. In one of my exam rooms, I have that. Um, I start out every morning with uh, modified sit-ups and core strengthening work. <clears throat> not that, Luckily, knock on wood, <laughs> I haven't had any chronic low back pain like so many of my friends and family and patients have but I've really been dedicated to that core exercises. And one of the classic exercise programs for that is the McKenzie back exercise method. And we have a lot of this information on speakingwomenshealth.com. And it's good for strengthening your back, for improving posture. And another thing besides posture and exercise that I think doesn't get enough attention Uh, When you're over 30, you know, there's a natural wear and tear on your um, low back, your neck, um, hips, knees. Really proper footwear is not emphasized enough. And if you're walking constantly on hard concrete, uh, going barefoot, which is a lot more uh, trauma to the lower back, you really want to focus on good, supportive footwear. And that helps also keep your bones and joints in the proper alignment so that you're using um, uh, your joints in the appropriate fashion. And you want to protect the joint surfaces that can result in arthritis. You want to reduce the stress on the ligaments that hold your joints and spine together. And you want to prevent weird positions where your spine is flexed in an abnormal position. You see all these people looking down at their constant computer phone all the time. And um, you want to do this throughout the day. You want good seats. Um, I noticed getting transient sciatica when I would take long distance trips. Um, I would frequently lecture quite a lot around the country. And some of that was by driving. And if I was sitting in one position for too long, I would start getting a weird numbing sensation down my leg. And I fixed that with a sciatica uh, cushion pillow that was designed appropriately for prolonged sitting. Now, of course, in general, I think if you're sitting at work or at your home work setting or in a car or if you're a trucker, you know, whatever, pilot, any anytime prolonged sitting, you want to try to get up every couple hours and move around for sure. Um, you do want to sit straight with your shoulders back 
and uh, women that have good size breasts sometimes need to do shoulder and upper back exercises and wear a really well-fitting bra that can help mid-thoracic back pain. Um, all three back curves should be present while sitting. A small rolled up towel or lumbar roll can be used to help you maintain the normal curves in your back. Uh, my brother, who just recently started getting some sciatica, <clears throat> noticed that when he would do the lumbar roll, along with stretching and exercise, that that certainly helped. You can find a good sitting position when you're not using back support or a lumbar roll by sitting at the end of your chair and slouch completely. Draw yourself up and accentuate the curve of your back, lower back, as, as far as you can and hold for a few seconds. Release the position slightly, about 10 degrees, and that's the right sitting position. You want to also distribute your weight evenly over both your hips and bend your knees at a right angle <clears throat> and keep your knees even with or even slightly higher than your hips. And you can use a footrest or a stool if necessary, and it's best not to cross your legs. <clears throat> at work, it's very important to have a good chair. Um, I just recently ordered a new one for my office because I sit there and do a lot of computer work, manuscript work. I read bone densities, uh, and you really want <clears throat> an appropriate workstation. And you want to be able to rest your elbows <clears throat> on your arm or chair or desk and keep your shoulders relaxed. And you don't want to twist at the waist while sitting. You want to turn your whole body. In terms of driving, okay, many of us drive a fair amount. You want to use a good back support lumbar roll if needed at the curve of your back. Your knees should be at the same level or higher than your hips. And some of these new cars have all these adjustable things. You want to move the seat close to the steering wheel to support the curve of your back. And the seat should be close enough to allow your knees to bend and your feet to comfortably reach the pedals. In terms of correct lifting procedures, uh, to pick an object up that's lower than your waist, keep your back straight and bend at the knees and hips. Don't put that pressure on the back by leaning forward. Uh, you want to tighten and uh, stabilize your abdominal stomach muscles and lift the object primarily using your leg muscles and straighten out your knees in a steady motion. Stand upright without twisting. Move your feet forward when lifting an object. And to lower the object, place your feet as you did to lift. Tighten the muscles and bend at the knees and hips. And for heaven's sakes, get assistance if you need it. Do not pull a muscle or a tendon or strain yourself. Um, younger people, family members, neighbors, um, you may need to plan if you're going to have to lift a heavy object. <clears throat> the other reason why I like women to be careful when lifting heavy items besides the back is the pelvic floor. And if you haven't listened to any of our podcasts on urinary incontinence, the pelvic floor is very important at supporting the bladder as well as the rectum and the pelvic contents. And because women have a vagina and many of them have had childbirth and pregnancy that puts a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor. And if your pelvic floor isn't strong or is it's overly stressed because of chronic valsalva, that can throw out your back, your hips, and cause bladder leakage. <clears throat> so all of this intertwines together. So now we're going to talk about the dreaded sciatica, which my good friend is suffering with. And my husband has had, my brother has had, I'm sure you know many people in your own circle who've suffered with this. Perhaps you yourself have. <clears throat> and if you haven't, if you've got a back, which we pretty much all do, <laughs> you're at risk. So sciatica refers to pain, weakness, numbness, and tingling in one of the lower legs, left or right. And it's caused by injury or pressure to the big sciatic nerve. And sciatica is simply a descriptive medical symptom. It's not per se a only one condition, medical condition. And usually sciatica goes away on its own uh, and can be treated 
with some rest, then physical therapy, uh, strengthening. Um, but when you have sciatica, you really should consult your physician. And it's important to get the right diagnosis. I mean, sometimes it's misdiagnosed as hip pain or knee pain or arthritis or piriformis syndrome um, or something else. Or sometimes it's misdiagnosed as sciatica when it's something more serious. Although sciatica is pretty serious enough based on the pain. So according to spine experts at the Cleveland Clinic, your sciatic nerve is the longest and the thickest nerve in your body. It's up to two centimeters, like the size of a penny. And it's actually a bundle of nerves that come from the nerve roots by branching off at your lower spinal cord. You have two sciatic nerves, one on the left and one on the right, and it runs right down through your hip and buttocks. And they each go down the leg on the side of your body until they reach just below the knee. Once it hits your knee, it splits into all different other nerves that enervate the lower leg, foot, and your toes, your little piggies. Having sciatica means that you can experience mild to up to severe pain anywhere where the nerves connect to the sciatic nerve. They can affect your lower back, hip, buttocks, legs, Some symptoms extend as far as your feet and toes, depending on the nerve roots affected. The types of sciatica. Well, there's two general types. And regardless of what type you have, (laughs) the effects are the same. These types include true sciatica, which is a condition or injury that directly affects the sciatic nerve. Then there's sciatic-like conditions that happen for another reason related to the sciatic nerve or the nerves that bundle to form it. Most clinicians in the healthcare field just say sciatica, but it does matter when your clinician is determining what the best way to treat it is. So how common is sciatica? Well, 40% of people have experienced some of it in their lifetime. It rarely happens before age 20 unless it's injury related, like in my son. Uh, Like I mentioned, I only personally have experienced it transiently briefly just from prolonged sitting. But other people can have it much more frequently or much more severely. And sciatica can happen because any condition that affects the sciatic nerve uh, can affect any of the five spinal nerve bundles that connect to make the sciatic nerve. So some of these conditions that cause sciatica are herniated discs. That's the big one. Degenerative disc disease, spinal stenosis, either from arthritis or from that ligamentum flavum congenitally like my husband had. Foramenal stenosis, when the bones overgrow and encroach on the nerves that leave the spine. Spondylolisthesis, that's when there's a, um, a shift of the vertebrae, which stack on each other, and then there's a disc in the middle. Part of the reason why most people get a little shorter with age, about up to an inch to an inch and a half in women and up to two inches in men, depending on how tall you are and how long your spine is, is that you lose the water in the discs. And so there's more crunching and pressure on the spine. Osteoarthritis is a very common condition. 80% of humans have it. Uh, Most people start to notice some changes in their big toe bunion, even in their 20s. Most people by their 30s have some in the spine, the um, cervical spine and the lower spine. Uh, It's more common if it runs in your family. It's more common if you've had injuries or muscle imbalances or trauma. Certainly pregnancy is a risk for lower back pain, uh, hip arthritis, because there's so much motion and flexibility and changing of the whole entire pelvis to allow uh, the baby's head to come out uh, through the birth canal. <clears throat> now, tumors, cysts, or, over, or other growths, either benign or malignant, can press on the nerves. There's also another um, syndrome called conus medullus syndrome. And then the dreaded Cotta Aquinas syndrome, which is an emergency. And that's when 
the nerves of the lumbosacral area to the lower legs and also the bowels and bladder are significantly affected. So what are the risk factors for sciatica besides being human? Well, it can happen for many reasons and uh, different risk factors, but they're not limited to having a current or previous injury. Anytime you have an injury to your spine, you're at increased risk of sciatica. There's also just the normal wear and tear. As we all get older, the normal wear and tear can lead to pinched nerves, herniated discs, and other conditions. And the age-related osteoarthritis can play a role. And one of the big things that's happening in America is having excess weight and obesity. And I really think the convenience foods, the added sugars, the seed oils um, cause a lot more inflammation and a lot more metabolic syndrome, driving insulin, driving weight gain around the belly and the organs. And we have had other podcasts on weight loss, on becoming less sweet, on diabetes, uh, on intermittent fasting. So most Americans, sadly, are carrying too much weight. And just like pregnancy weight throws the spine off, obesity weight in the belly, that so-called beer gut, or the excess weight around the middle that a lot of women at menopause get if they're not treating their menopause, getting their sleep, cutting back on calories, adding weightlifting to their schedule, and really working on staying healthy in the second half of life. So if you're carrying anything, heavy packages, a child or a toddler, a pregnancy weight, or that beer gut, it's really hard on your spine and your muscles stretch and have to do more work to keep you vertical. And just 13 pounds of extra weight gain transmits significantly um, to increase risk for the need for knee replacement. And if you can just lose 13 pounds, many people have much less pain in their lower extremity. Uh, So that seems to be kind of a a magic number. A lot of people have insufficient core muscle strength. So the core muscles include your lower back and your abs. And like in the crane analogy, if you have a stronger core, it's like upgrading your crane components to lift up a heavier load. So those of you in the construction business and mechanical industry know exactly what I'm talking about. Your abdominal muscles are so strong, they help anchor your back muscles. And that's why I start out every day with ab exercises. Now, your job, your career, your lifestyle, if it requires heavy lifting, lots of bending, being in awkward, weird, unusual positions, you may have more back pain. But jobs with prolonged sitting, too, without good back support may also increase your risk not using good posture and form when lifting, uh, not using proper form when weightlifting or strength training or being some weekend warrior and not really working into it. Some people need trainers. They need the evaluation first of their physician to see if their cardiovascular fitness is up to start to exercise. And then they may need to work with a physical therapist. Tobacco. Nicotine is very addictive and it definitely reduces circulation. And smokers or anyone who uses nicotine has a much higher rate of back pain and sciatica. Sometimes people have sciatica and we can't really find out why. Um, Most people do recover from it, but you can have long-term pain. And if the nerve is pressed for a long enough period of time, you can get chronic muscle atrophy and weakness and develop drop foot or lose some of the strength in your limb. Also, the same thing happens with the neck. If if it's pinched off and it goes to your arm, you can lose muscle mass and muscle strength if it's not treated in a timely fashion. And because a lot of insurance companies require non-invasive conservative therapy, physical therapy, maybe injections by a pain Uh, anesthesia specialist before surgical intervention for a ruptured disc or a sac that's pressing on these nerve roots, 
it's important not to delay. Even if you're someone who wants to minimize invasive procedures, and I understand that, and that's laudable to do everything as natural and as lifestyle related as possible. That's always our goal. But time is of the essence when you have nerve symptoms. And it's getting harder sometimes to access healthcare depending on what part of the country you're in, how long the wait times are. If you haven't listened to the podcast on how to make an appointment, those tips and tricks by our guest podcaster, Sylvia Morrison, who um, my one friend was severe sciatica, was ready to just go to a open pay cash MRI because of all the delays with the insurance and then trying to book it and wait. Um, you know, my advice was just go and get this done, even if you're paying out of pocket because this is so severe. Uh, and Sylvia to the rescue got on the phone and knew exactly what to do. So uh, having inside information and knowing how to work the system and being your own advocate or your family's advocate if your family's in such pain. I mean, with my husband, you know, he went to the doctor, he went to the physical therapist, but thankfully I had that inside track from being on social media on speaking of women's health in the Cleveland Clinic to help facilitate the treatment. So because sciatic can potentially cause permanent nerve damage, which can relate to the loss of feeling in the legs or muscle strength or movement, you do need to see a physician who knows how to evaluate you. And if you're seeing an APP, they can be very well trained if they're a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, especially if they've worked in the field for a while. But if you have more serious symptoms or you're not getting better, you do want to make sure that you're seeing an expert physician because your nerves and muscles and your body function are very important. Now, there's a straight leg test that can be used for diagnose, diagnosing back problems. And we look for when you lift your legs, what, what point do you feel the pain? Um, and that can help differentiate it. Um, we also use other methods, including the history and good old physical exam and the neurologic exam checking sensation and reflexes, watching how you walk, um, doing that straight leg raise test, and um, other flexibility and muscle strength checks, range of motion of your hips and knees. So we treat it by trying to reduce the pain and pressure on the spine and increase mobility. Um, surgery many times has to be considered if the conservative methods fail and if there's an anatomic reason that links to exactly where the pain is. So as I've told my family and friends and patients, if you have leg pain because of something wrong in your back, those surgical outcomes tend to be a lot better than if you just have diffuse back pain without neurologic symptoms that you're having surgery just for that. We've talked about the self-treatment um, with heating. Um, with acute injury, many times cold or ice packs reduce the swelling. Heat is usually used to warm up and the muscles so that they can be stretched. Whether you do heat or cold, it's usually only for 20 minutes. You don't want to freeze your skin or burn your skin. Uh, sometimes topical uh, sprays like menthol or asper cream can give some people some comfort. But again, you can't absorb a lot through your skin, so you have to follow the instructions. Even things that are over the counter can be deadly. Um, you know, athletes who've wrapped their whole body in these topical agents and then wrapped up their whole body and absorbed a lot um, have had serious injury and death. Uh, over the counter doses of Tylenol acetaminophen can kill your liver. So just because something's not prescription doesn't mean you have to not be mindful about how you use it. Stretching an activity, you want to learn how to stretch your back and your legs. There's three stretches that the chiropractors typically recommend for sciatica, the piriformis stretch, the runner's lunge, and cobra. But if self-care doesn't work, see your physician. And if you have uh, numbness, tingling, muscle weakness, you shouldn't try to self-treat that. You do need to seek medical assistance. We've talked about the conservative treatments, the self-care, 
painkillers, muscle relaxants, sometimes anti-seizure medicines like Lyrica and Gabapentin can help chronic nerve pain. I think physical therapy is so important. <clears throat> sometimes altering your activities. Um, maybe you could really hit the gym and do intense weightlifting when you were younger, but as you get older, you may need to shift to elliptical instead of running or swimming or water aerobics. Spinal injections like corticosteroids can provide short-term relief. Um, they usually require local anesthesia and someone who is an expert in doing this, sometimes it's done under fluoroscopy so they can see exactly where the needle's going in. My husband was very fearful at first to have this done. He didn't want anything to damage his spinal cord and that's completely understandable. And so there's a lot of extra precautions that are taken because your spine is very critical to your function. We've talked about massage therapy and yoga and acupuncture. Some people have tried dry needling reducing stress, getting good sleep, getting a new mattress. I ask my brother about the mattress. I ask about his work and his recreation. And he noted that, oh, it's too cold right now in Alabama uh, to be water skiing because they had a little bit of a cold st uh, stretch. And he notes that when he does intense activity like water skiing and barefooting like he does, he overall feels better because exercise, both aerobic and also muscle building, improves blood flow and nutrition cannot be underemphasized. And we've had several podcasts about healthy eating and superfoods and anti-inflammatory foods. And we'll have future podcasts on uh, pharmaco uh, genomics related to food. I think that there's a lot we don't know. I've had some patients who've gone on strict plant-based diets and their chronic pain and joint pain go away and their arthritis improves. Conversely, I've had patients go on keto, almost total carnivore diets and say that their Crohn's and their um, inflammatory arthritis uh, get better. Um, certainly if you have celiac disease, and we have several uh, columns and resources on celiac on our website, that can definitely improve skin and joint and inflammation. Uh, but even people without celiac disease, like my older sister, she swears by if she takes all gluten out of her diet, she doesn't have her osteoarthritis symptoms. So it's individual. I can't say that one is better than another. I think we need a whole lot more research. Uh, but I do think for some people, getting the inflammatory processed foods and seed oils and sugar, um, alcohol um, out of their diet really reduces their pain. I also think that some women um, have low-grade autoimmune conditions that need to be addressed by a rheumatologist or an a, a expert in the area, and sometimes functional medicine approaches can help. Sometimes low-dose anti-inflammatories like uh, hydroxychloroquine, Plaquenil can make huge differences. You need to pay attention to how long it takes for your joints to get going. If it's just 10 minutes of stiffness, that's usual osteoarthritis from aging. Uh, if it's longer than that, especially an hour, then it could be something autoimmune deserving more intensive evaluation. So getting back to sciatica, how soon after treatment will I feel better? Well, it depends on what the cause is. Usually most people are better in four to six weeks without needing uh, intervention or aggressive surgical treatment or minimally invasive pain procedures or minimally invasive discectomies or other neurosurgical procedures. But more severe cases can take weeks or months to get better. And it's not good to wait too long. Um, if you wait more than six months to get treatment, usually it's it portends uh, a less good outcome. So don't wait too long. Now, we talked about prevention. But even if you take good care of your back and you do all the exercises, it doesn't mean that you may not have problems. Um, but you can reduce your risk by keeping strong core muscles, having good nutrition, keeping your weight down, and not using nicotine, maintaining good posture. Um, we have various ways to help people get rid of nicotine if you're addicted to it. Uh, there's improvements in the treatment of obesity. So if you've tried and you've done intermittent fasting and you've taken out 
the bad foods in your diet, you've cut down portions, you've added exercise, you've made sure you get eight hours of sleep and you're still stuck, then you may need to see someone who specializes in this uh, weight problem. <clears throat> Protect yourself from falls. You know, wear good shoes. Keep things well lit. Don't have clutter and loose rugs. Uh, make sure there's grab bars in the bathroom and rails in the bathtub area. And take the time needed to recover. Um, you know, don't go and get a second injury uh, after your first injury. You can still be as active as possible. You don't need to sit at home or lay in bed. Uh, look for activities like water aerobics, swimming, yoga, chair yoga, which I'm going to be about ready to go do in a few minutes. Tai Chi. Now, in terms of... Um, pregnancy, uh, you want to make sure that uh, if you can get to a better body weight before pregnancy and strengthen your core muscles, that can help. Um, sciatica is common in, in pregnancy, uh, and it's more likely to occur in pregnancy in part because of all those hormones that loosen the ligaments and affect the connective tissue in the spine and the hip. And so sometimes that's when there could be disc slippage or pinched nerves. I remember getting in and out of my car. I could actually feel all the pelvic bones like just wiggle around and move when I was pregnant. It was such a strange feeling. Towards the end of pregnancy, the weight and the position of the baby can press on the nerves. But good news, there's ways to ease sciatic pain during pregnancy and usually the pain resolves after birth and physical therapy and massage, warm showers, heat, and appropriately approved medications, which are much more limited in pregnancy. So thank you so much for joining me on this long episode about chronic back pain and sciatica. If you've got other questions or topics you want to hear about, go on speakingofwomenshealth.com and complete our contact us form about the link. And maybe you'll hear our, your questions answered on a future podcast episode. If you don't already subscribe, please hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn. You can also watch our video podcast on the Rumble channel or listen on YouTube. And if you want to support us, leave us a five-star rating, share this podcast with others, or go on our website and donate to our nonprofit. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time in the Sunflower House.